24. Yes, there is certainly something objectionable and repellent about me, thought Levin after leaving the Shichubatskys, as he walked toward his brother's lodgings. I do not get on with other people. They say it is pride. No, I'm not even proud. If I had any pride, I should not have put myself into such a position. And he pictured to himself Vronsky, happy, kind, clever, calm, and certainly never placing himself in such a terrible position as he, Levin, had been in that evening. Yes, she was bound to choose him. It had to be so, and I have no cause to complain of anyone or anything. It was my own fault. What right had I to imagine that she would wish to unite her life with mine? Who and what am I? A man of no account, wanted by no one and of no use to anyone. And he remembered his brother Nicholas, and kept his mind gladly on that memory. Is he not right that everything on earth is evil and horrid? And have we judged Brother Nicholas fairly? Of course, from Borkovi's point of view, who saw him in a ragged coat and tipsy, he's a despicable fellow. But I know him from another side. I know his soul. I know that we resemble one another. And yet I, instead of looking him up, dine out and came here. Levin went up to a lamppost and read his brother address which he had in his pocketbook, and then hired a sledge. On the long way to his brother's, he recalled all the events he knew of Nicholas's life. He recalled how, despite the ridicule of his fellow students, his brother had lived like a monk while at the university, and for a year after, strictly observing all the religious rites, attending service, fasting, avoiding all pleasures, and especially women. And then how he suddenly broke loose, became intimate with the vilest people, and gave himself up to unbridled debauchery. He remembered how his brother had brought a boy from the country to educate, and in a fit of anger had so beaten the lad that proceedings were commenced against him for causing bodily harm. He remembered an affair with a sharper, to whom his brother had lost money, and whom he had first given a promissory note and then prosecuted on a charge of fraud. That was when his brother Sergius had paid the money for him. Then he remembered the night which Nicholas had spent in the police cells for disorderly conduct, and the disgraceful proceedings he had instigated against his brother Sergius Ivanich, whom he accused of not having paid out to him his share of his mother's fortune. And lastly, the time when his brother took an official appointment in one of the western provinces, and was there arrested for assaulting an elder. It was all very disgusting, but to Levin it did not seem nearly so disgusting as it must have seemed to those who did not know Nicholas, nor his whole story, nor his heart. Levin remembered that when Nicholas was passing through his pious stage of fasting, visiting monks and going to church, when he was seeking in religion for help to curb his passionate nature. Not only did no one encourage him, but everyone, and Levin among them, made fun of him. He was teased and called Noah and Monk, and then when he broke loose no one helped him, but all turned away from him with horror and disgust. Levin felt that his brother Nicholas, in his soul, in the innermost depths of his soul, despite the depravity of his life, was no worse than those who despised him. It was not his fault that he was born with his ungovernable temper and with a cramped mind. He always wished to do right. I will tell him everything. I will get him to tell me everything. I will show him that I love and therefore understand him, Levin decided in his mind. As toward eleven o'clock he drove up to the hotel of which he had the address. Upstairs, numbers twelve and thirteen, said the hall porter in reply to Levin's question. Is he in? I expect so. The door of number 12 was ajar, and from within, visible in a streak of light, issued dense fumes of inferior and weak tobacco. Levin heard a stranger's voice, but knew at once that his brother was there, for he heard him coughing. As he entered the doorway, the stranger's voice was saying, It all depends on how intelligently and rationally the affair is conducted. Constantine Levin glanced into the room, which was beyond a partition and saw that the speaker was a young man with an enormous head of hair, who wore a workman's coat, and that a young pockmarked woman in a woolen dress without collar or cuffs was sitting on the sofa. He could not see his brother, and his heart sank painfully at the thought that Nicholas lived among such strange people. No one noticed him, and, as he took off his galoshes, he overheard what the man in the workman's coat was saying. He was talking about some commercial enterprise. Ah, oh, let the privileged classes go to the devil! said his brother's voice with a cough. Masha, get us some supper and bring the wine if any is left, or send for some. 
the woman rose, came out from behind the partition, and saw Constantine. Here's a gentleman, Nicholas Dmitrich, she said. Whom do you want? said Nicholas Levin's voice angrily. It is I, answered Constantine Levin, coming forward into the lamplight. Who's I? said the voice of Nicholas Levin still more angrily. Constantine heard how he rose hurriedly and caught against something, and then in the doorway before him he saw the familiar, yet ever strange figure of his brother, wild, sickly, gigantic, lean, and round-shouldered, with large, frightened eyes. He was even more emaciated than three years before, when Constantine Levin had last seen him. He was wearing a short coat, and his hands and broad bones appeared more immense than ever. His hair was thinner, but the same straight moustache covered his lips, and the same eyes with a peculiar, naive gaze looked out at the newcomer. Ah, Kostya, he said suddenly, recognising his brother, and his eyes lit up with joy. But at the same moment he turned to look at the young man, and convulsively jerked his head and neck, as if his necktie were strangling him. A movement Levin knew well, and quite another expression, a wild, suffering and cruel look, settled on his haggard face. I wrote both to you and to Sergei Zivanich that I do not know you and do not wish to know you. What is it? What do you want? He was not at all as Constantine had imagined him. Constantine, when thinking of him, had forgotten the most trying and worst part of his character, that which made intercourse with him so difficult. But now when he saw his face, and especially that convulsive movement of his head, he remembered it all. I do not want anything of you specially, he answered meekly. I have simply come to see you. His brother's timidity obviously softened Nicholas, whose lips quivered. Ah, you've come just for that, he said. Well, come in, sit down. Will we have some supper? Masha, get supper for three. No, wait a little. Do you know who this is? he added, turning to his brother and pointing to the man in the workman's coat. It's Mr. Kritsky, my friend ever since my Kiev days. A very remarkable fellow. Of course the police are after him, because he's not a scoundrel. And he glanced round at everybody present as was his way. Seeing that the woman in the doorway was about to go out, he shouted to her, Wait, I told you! And in the awkward and blundering manner familiar to Constantine, he again looked round at everybody and began to tell his brother about Kritsky, how he had been expelled from the university because he had started a society to help the poorer students, and also Sunday schools, and how he had afterwards taught in an elementary school, and had been turned out from that too, and had then been tried on some charge or other. You were at Kiev University? Constantine Levin asked Kritsky, in order to break the awkward silence that followed. Yes, at Kiev, Kritsky replied with an angry frown. And this woman, said Nicholas Levin, interrupting him and pointing to her, is my life's companion, Mary Nikolaevna. I took her out of a house. And as he said this, he again jerked his neck. But I love and respect her, and beg all those who wish to know me, he added, raising his voice and scowling, to love and respect her. She's just the same to me as a wife, just the same. So now you know whom you have to deal with, and if you fear you will be degraded, there is the door. And again his eyes glanced questioningly around. Why should I be degraded? I don't understand. Well, Masha, order supper for three, with vodka and wine. No, wait. No, never mind. You may go. 25. So you see, Nicholas Levin continued with an effort, wrinkling his brow and twitching. He evidently found it hard to decide what to say and to do. Do you see, he pointed to a bundle of iron rods tied together with a string in a corner of the room. Do you see that? It is the beginning of a new business we are undertaking. The business is to be a productive association. Constantine hardly listened. He kept glancing at his brother's sickly, consumptive face and felt more and more sorry for him. Nor could he force himself to pay attention to what Nicholas was telling him about the association. He realised that this association was merely an anchor to save his brother from self-contempt. Nicholas Levin continued speaking. You know that capitalism oppresses the workers. Our workmen, the peasants, bear the whole burden of labour, but are so placed that, work as they may, they cannot escape from their degrading condition. All the profits on their labour, by which they might better their condition, give themselves some leisure, 
and consequently gain some education. All this surplus value is taken away by the capitalist. And our society has so shaped itself that the more the people work, the richer the merchants and landowners will become, while the people will remain beasts of burden forever. And this system must be changed, he concluded, with an inquiring look at his brother. Yes, of course, said Constantine, looking intently at the hectic flush which had appeared on his brother's face below its prominent cheekbones. And so we are starting a locksmith's association, in which all the products and the profits and, above all, the instruments of production will become common property. Where will the business be? asked Constantine. In the village of Fosdrima, Kazan government. Why in a village? It seems to me there is plenty of work to do in the country as it is. Why start a locksmith's association there? Because the peasants are still just as much slaves as they used to be. And that is why you and Sergius Ivanich don't like it when anyone wishes to deliver them from their slavery, replied Nicholas Levin, irritated by Constantine's objection. Constantine sighed and at the same time looked round the room which was dismal and dirty. The sigh seemed to irritate Nicholas still more. I know your aristocratic outlook, and Sergius Ivanich's. I know that he uses all the powers of his mind to justify the existing evils. But why talk about Sergius Ivanich? said Levin with a smile. Sergius Ivanich, this is why, suddenly shouted Nicholas at the mention of the name, this is why. But what is the good of talking? One thing only. Why have you come here? You despise it. Well, that is all right. Then go away. Go. Go in God's name, he exclaimed, rising from his chair. Go. Go. I do not despise that at all, Constantine replied meekly. I don't even dispute it. Meanwhile, Mary Nikolaevna had come back. Nicholas gave her an angry look. She hurried up to him and said something in a whisper. I am not well and have grown irritable, said Nicholas, breathing heavily and quieting down. And you talk to me about Sergei Zivanich and his article. It is such rubbish, such humbug, such self-deception. What can a man write about justice who does not understand it? Have you read his article? he said, turning to Krisky again, sitting down to the table and clearing away from it a heap of half-filled cigarettes to make room. I have not read it, said Krisky morosely, evidently not wishing to join in the conversation. Why not? irritably answered Nicholas, still addressing Krisky. Because I consider it unnecessary to waste time on it. What do you mean? May I ask how you knew it would waste your time? That article is incomprehensible to many. I mean it is above them. But it is a different matter with me. I see through his thought, and therefore know why it's weak. Everyone remained silent. Krisky rose and took up his hat. Don't you want any supper? Well, goodbye. Come tomorrow and bring the locksmith. As soon as Krisky had gone out, Nicholas smiled and winked. He also is not much good, he remarked. I can see... But at that moment Krisky called him from outside the door. What do you want now? said Nicholas, and went out into the passage. Left alone with Maria Nikolaevna, Levin spoke to her. Have you been long with my brother? he asked. Yes, it's the second year now. His health is very bad. He drinks too much, she said. Really? What does he drink? He drinks vodka, and it's bad for him. Much vodka? whispered Levin. Yes she said, looking timidly toward the door, just as Nicholas returned. "'What were you talking about?' he asked, frowning and looking from one to the other with frightened eyes. "'What was it?' "'Nothing,' replied Levin in confusion. "'If you do not wish to tell me, do as you please. Only you have no business to talk to her. She's a street girl, and you're a gentleman,' he muttered, jerking his neck. "'You, I see, have examined and weighed everything here, "'and regard my errors with compassion,' he continued, again raising his voice. "'Nicholas Dmitrich, Nicholas Dmitrich," whispered Mary Nikolaevna, again approaching him. "'Well, all right, all right. "'How about supper? "'Ah, here it is,' he said, noticing a waiter who was bringing in a tray. "'Here, here, put it down here,' he said crossly, "'and at once poured out a wine glass full of vodka and drank it greedily.' Have a drink, will you? He said to his brother, brightening up at once. 
Well, we've had enough of Sergei Ivanich. I'm glad to see you, anyhow. Whatever one may say, after all, we are not strangers. Come, have a drink. Tell me what you are doing, he continued, greedily chewing a crust of bread and filling himself another glass. How are you getting on? I'm living alone in the country, as I did before, and I look after the farming, answered Constantine, observing with horror how greedily his brother ate and drank, and trying not to let it be seen that he noticed it. Why don't you get married? I had not the chance, replied Constantine, blushing. Why not? For me all that is over. I've spoiled my life. I've said, and still say, that if I had been given my share of the property when I wanted it, everything would have been different. Constantine hastened to change the subject. Do you know that your Vanusha is now a clerk in my office at Pokrovsk? He said. Nicholas jerked his head and grew thoughtful. Yes, tell me what is happening in Pokrovsk. Is the house still standing in the birch trees in our schoolroom? And is Philip the gardener really still living? How well I remember the garden house and the sofa. Mind, don't change anything in the house, but get married soon and set things going again as they used to be. Then I will come to you if you have a good wife. Come to me at once, said Levin. How well we might settle down there. I would come if I were sure I should not find Sergei Zivanich there. You won't find him there. I live quite apart from him. Still, say what you will, you must choose between him and me, said Nicholas with a timid look at his brother. His timidity touched Constantine. If you want my full confession about it, I will tell you that I take no side in your quarrel with Sergei Zivinich. You are both to blame. You more in external matters, and he more in essential ones. Ah, ah, then you've grasped it. You've grasped it, joyfully exclaimed Nicholas. But personally, if you care to know it, I value your friendship more, because... Why? Why? Constantine could not tell him that it was because Nicholas was unfortunate and needed friendship. But Nicholas understood that he meant just that, and frowning, again took hold of the vodka bottle. Enough, Nicholas Dmitrich, said Mary Nikolaevna, stretching out a plump arm with its bare wrist to take the bottle. Let go. Leave me alone. I'll thrash you, shouted he. Mary Nikolaevna gave him a mild, kindly smile, which evoked one from Nicholas, and she took away the bottle. Do you think she doesn't understand? said Nicholas. She understands it all better than any of us. There really is something good and sweet about her. You were never in Moscow before? Constantine asked very politely, just in order to say something. Don't speak to her in that way. It frightens her. No one but the magistrate, when she was tried for an attempt to escape from the house of ill fame, ever spoke to her so politely. Oh heavens, how senseless everything is in this world, he suddenly exclaimed. All these new institutions, these magistrates, these zemstvos, what a confusion it all is. And he began to relate all his encounters with these new institutions. Constantine Levin listened to him, and the condemnation of the social institutions, which he shared with him, and had often expressed, was unpleasant to him when he heard it from his brother's lips. We shall understand it better in the next world, he said playfully. In the next world? Ah, I do dislike that next world said Nicholas, fixing his wild, frightened eyes on his brother's face. One would think that to leave all these abominations, these models, one's own and other people's, would be good. Yes, I fear death. I fear it terribly. He shuddered. Do drink something. Would you like some champagne? Well, let us go out somewhere or other. Let us go to the gypsies. Do you know I've become fond of the gypsies and the Russian folk songs? His speech began to grow confused, and he jumped from one subject to another. With Masha's help, Constantine succeeded in persuading him not to go out anywhere, and got him into bed quite tipsy. Masha promised to write to Constantine in case of need, and to try to persuade Nicholas to go and live with him. 26. Next morning, Constantine Levin left Moscow, and toward evening he reached home. On his way back in the train, he talked with his fellow passengers about politics and the new railways, and felt oppressed just as in Moscow, by the confusion of the views expressed, by discontent with himself and a vague sense of shame. But when he got out of the train at his station, and by the dim light from the station windows, saw his one-eyed coachman, Ignat, with his coat collar turned up, 
and his sledge with its carpet lined back, his horses with their tied up tails, and the harness with its rings and tassels. And when Ignat, while still putting the luggage into the sledge, began telling him the village news, how the contractor had come and Pavan carved, Levin felt that the confusion was beginning to clear away, and his shame and self dissatisfaction to pass. He felt this at the mere sight of Ignat and the horses. But when he had put on the sheepskin coat that had been brought for him, and, well wrapped up, had seated himself in the sledge and started homeward, turning over in his mind the orders he would give about the work on the estate, and as he watched the side horse, once a saddle horse that had been overridden, a spirited animal from the dawn, he saw what had befallen him in quite a different light. He felt that he was himself, and did not wish to be anyone else. He only wished now to be better than he had been formerly. First of all, he decided that he would no longer hope for the exceptional happiness which marriage was to have given him, and consequently he would not underrate the present as he had done. Secondly, he would never again allow himself to be carried away by passion, the repulsive memory of which had so tormented him when he was making up his mind to propose. Then, remembering his brother Nicholas, he determined that he would never allow himself to forget him again, but would watch over him, keep him in sight, and be ready to help when things went hard with him. And he felt that that would be soon. Then his brother's talk about communism, which he had taken lightly at the time, now made him think. He considered an entire change of economic conditions nonsense, but he had always felt the injustice of his superfluities compared with the peasant's poverty, and now decided, in order to feel himself quite justified, that though he had always worked hard and lived simply, he would in future work still more and allow himself still less luxury. And it all seemed to him so easy to carry out that he was in a pleasant reverie the whole way home, and it was with cheerful hopes for a new and better life that he reached his house toward nine o'clock in the evening. A light fell on the snow-covered space in front of the house from the windows of the room of his old nurse, Agata Mikhailovna, who now acted as his housekeeper. She had not yet gone to bed, and Kuzma, whom she had roused, came running out barefoot and still half asleep into the porch. Alaska, a setter bitch, ran out too, almost throwing Kuzma off his feet, and whined and rubbed herself against Levin's knees, jumping up and wishing but not daring to put her front paws on his chest. You've soon come back, sir, said Agatha Mikhailovna. I was homesick, Agatha Mikhailovna. Visiting is all very well, but there is no place like home, he replied, and went into his study. A candle just brought in gradually lit up the study, and its familiar details became visible. The stag's horns, the bookshelves, the looking glass, the hot air aperture of the stove with its brass lid, which had long been in need of repair, his father's couch, the large table on which were an open volume, a broken ashtray, and an exercise book in his handwriting. When he saw all this, he was overcome by a momentary doubt of the possibility of starting the new life of which he had been dreaming on his way. All these traces of his old life seemed to seize hold of him and say, No, you will not escape us, and will not be different, but will remain such as you have been, full of doubts, full of dissatisfaction with yourself, and of vain attempts at improvement followed by failures, and continual hopes of the happiness which has escaped you and is impossible for you. That was what the thing said. But another voice within his soul was saying that one must not submit to the past, and that one can do anything with oneself and obeying the latter voice, he went to the corner where two thirty-six-pound dumbbells lay and began doing gymnastic exercises with them to invigorate himself. He heard a creaking of steps at the door and hurriedly put down the dumbbells. His steward entered and said that the Lord be thanked, everything was all right, but that the buckwheat had burned in the new drying kiln. This news irritated Levin. The new kiln had been built and partly invented by him, the steward had always been against the new kiln, and now proclaimed with suppressed triumph that the buckwheat had got burnt. Levin felt quite certain that if it had been burnt, it was only because the precautions about which he had given instructions over and over again had been neglected. He was vexed, and he reprimanded the steward. But the steward had one important and pleasant event to report. Pava, his best and most valuable cow, bought that a cattle show, had carved. Kuzma, bring me my sheepskin, and you tell them to bring a lantern, 
I will go and have a look at her, he said to the steward. The sheds where the most valuable cattle were kept were just behind the house. Crossing the yard past the heap of snow by the lilac bush, he reached the shed. There was a warm, steaming smell of manure when the frozen door opened, and the cows, astonished at the unaccustomed light of the lantern, began moving on their clean straw. Levin saw the broad, smooth, black-mottled back of a Dutch cow. The bull, Burkett, with a ring through his nose, was lying down and almost rose up, but changed his mind and only snorted a couple of times as they passed by. The red beauty Pava, enormous as a hippopotamus, turned her back, hiding her calf from the newcomers and sniffing at it. Levin entered the stall and examined Pava, who, becoming excited, was about to low, but quieted down when Levin moved the calf toward her, and sighing heavily began licking it with her rough tongue. The calf fumbled about, pushing its nose under its mother's belly and swinging its little tail. "'Show a light here, Theodore. Here,' said Levin, examining the calf. "'Like its mother,' he said, although the colour is its father's. "'Very fine, big-boned and deep-flanked. "'Vasily Fedorich, isn't she fine?' he said, turning to the steward and quite forgiving him for the buckwheat under the influence of his satisfaction about the calf. Whom could she take after and not to be good? Simon, the contractor, came the day after you left. We shall have to employ him, Constantine Dimitrich, said the steward. I told you about the machine. This one question led Levin back to all the details of his farming, which was on a large and elaborate scale. He went straight from the cowshed to the office, and after talking things over with the steward and with Simon, the contractor, he returned to the house and went directly upstairs to the drawing room. 27. It was a large old-fashioned house, and though only Levin was living in it, he used and heated the whole of it. He knew this to be foolish and even wrong, and contrary to his new plans, but this house was a whole world to Levin. It was the world in which his father and mother had lived and died. They had lived a life which appeared to him ideally perfect, and which he had dreamed of renewing with a wife and family of his own. Levin could scarcely remember his mother. His conception of her was to him a sacred memory, and in his imagination, his future wife was to be a repetition of the enchanting and holy ideal of womanhood that his mother had been. He could not imagine the love of a woman without marriage, and even picture to himself a family first, and then the woman who would give him the family. His views on marriage, therefore, did not resemble those of most of his acquaintances, for whom marriage was only one of many social affairs. For Levin, it was the chief thing in life, on which the whole happiness of life depended, and now he had to renounce it. When he had settled in the armchair in the little drawing room where he had always had his tea, and Agatha Mikhailovna had brought it in for him, and had sat down at the window with her usual remark, I will sit down, sir. He felt that, strange to say, he had not really forgotten his dreams, and that he could not live without them. With her, or with another, they would come true. He read his book, and followed what he read, stopping now and then to listen to Agata Mikhailovna, who chattered indefatigably. And at the same time, various pictures of farming and future family life rose disconnectedly in his mind. He felt that in the depth of his soul, something was settling down, adjusting and composing itself. He listened to Agata Mikhailovna's talk of how Prokhor had forgotten the Lord, was spending on drink the money Levin had given him to buy a horse with, and had beaten his wife nearly to death. He listened and read, and remembered the whole sequence of thoughts raised by what he was reading. It was a book of Tyndall's on heat. He recalled his disapproval of Tyndall's self-conceit concerning the cleverness of experiment, and his lack of a philosophic outlook. And suddenly the joyous thought came uppermost. In two years' time I shall have two Dutch cows in my herd, and Papa herself may still be alive. There will be twelve cows by Burkett, and these three to crown all. Splendid! He returned to his book. Well, let us grant that electricity and heat are one and the same, but can we substitute the one quantity for the other in solving an equation? No. Then what of it? The connection between all the forces of nature can be felt instinctively without all doubt. It will be especially good when Papa's calf is already a red muddled cow, and the whole herd in which these three will be. Splendid! To go out with my wife and the visitors and meet the herd. My wife will say, We... Constantine and I reared this calf like a baby. 
How can you be interested in these things? The visitor will ask. All that interests him interests me. But who is she? And he remembered what had happened in Moscow. Well, what is to be done? It is not my fault. But now everything will be on new lines. It is nonsense to say that life will prevent it, that the past prevents it. I must struggle to live a better, far better life. He lifted his head and pondered. Old Laska, who had not yet quite digested her joy at her master's return, and had run out to bark in the yard, now came back, bringing a smell of fresh air with her into the room, and, wagging her tail, she approached him, and putting her head under his hand, whined plaintively, asking to be patted. She all but speaks, said Agatha Mikhailovna. She's only a dog, but she understands that her master has come back feeling depressed. Why depressed? Ah, don't I see? I want to understand gentlefolk by this time. I've grown up among them from a child. Never mind, my dear, as long as you have good health and a clean conscience. Levin looked at her intently, surprised that she knew so well what was in his mind. Shall I bring you a little more tea? she said, and went out with his cup. Laska kept on pushing her head under his hand. He patted her a little, and she curled herself up at his feet, with her head on her outstretched hind paw. And to show that all was now well and satisfactory, she slightly opened her mouth, smacked her sticky lips, and drawing them more closely over her old teeth, lay still in blissful peace. Lavin attentively watched this last movement of hers. And it's just the same with me, he said to himself. It's just the same with me. What does it matter? All is well.